Hello everybody, welcome along to this video, which is Mr. Johnson Teaches Gerald Croft Revision, part of the series of videos I've put together revising all elements of an Inspector Calls, including, as this one, the key characters for you. A reminder then that Inspector Calls is part of your GCSE English Literature, and you will find it on paper 2, and it's section A, so that is the first part of the second lit paper that you will be sitting, with the next part of the exam, section B being the poetry, and section C being the unseen poetry. So as you watch Watch this video then, please make sure you have got pen and paper ready. It's really important to revise, of course, and watching this video is what you're doing by revising. However, it's also extra important that you are making your own notes. Firstly, it means you've got something to look back at as you move towards your exams, and secondly, you're much more likely to hang on to that information that you learned from this video. So pause this video and go grab pen and paper if you haven't got some already, and if you have, let's get moving through this video. And the first thing then, who is Gerald Croft? Well, so Gerald is the only member on the stage there, apart from the inspector, who is not part of the family and ignoring Edna there as well. So he is coming into the family, which is why he's got a different surname from the Burling family. So who is he? He's the son to Sir George and Lady Croft, we find out early on in the play. We don't find out any more about them, but they certainly sound very important and very grand, the fact that both of them have got titles, so it's Sir George Croft. Um, we know that he's been working with his father's business, which we hear is called Crofts Limited, and it seems that that has been a rival to Mr. Burling's company, which is Burling and Company. Um, but they're about to marry Sheila. He gets propo he proposes to her, excuse me, early on in the play, and they become engaged. And it seems like that's going to be a really good deal for the two businesses. It's likely to unite the two businesses. Um, he's described in the stage directions, the third bullet point down there, is the easy, well-bred man about town. Easy makes him seem very relaxed and very comfortable with uh, where he is, this setting of wealth. Um, well-bred, so he's coming from a background, Sir George and Lady Croft. It seems like the Croft name is a, is a good name and an old name. Um, and also man about town. He knows his way around, he socialises, he goes out. So this is somebody who's very much of this sort of, of this class, the upper class. As it says on the next bullet point, he proposes to Sheila at the start of the play. Uh, she accepts. And then we find out later on that his key link to Eva Smith, who at this point is then known as Daisy Renton, uh, is uh, that he has slept with her. And this is after he lent her a friend's apartment to help her get back on her feet, meaning that she was in a position where she needed help and he gave her somewhere to stay while she was uh, able to do so. So that's who Gerald is. Um, what does he do then throughout the place? This is a bit of a running uh, bullet point list of some of the key things that Gerald does. And my other question is, does he change? Because that's really key for understanding the play. Some characters do change and some characters don't. And it's important which do and which don't. So he starts to play at the family meal. He starts by proposing to Sheila very early on. Um, there's a lot of Gerald agreeing with Mr. Burling about business and how businesses should be run, as in how it should be run for profit, not given into workers' demands is what I've said there as well. Um, when Mr. Burling is talking about sacking the workers, um, then he is all in agreement with that. Um, he also agrees early on with Mr. Burling's incorrect predictions. So when Mr. Burling makes his big speech at the start of the play about how war's not going to happen, uh, Gerald agrees with him. So already that really makes him seem part of that side of, uh, of almost like the capitalist side. Um, he is interrogated by the inspector, asks all the questions. Um, after Mr. Burling and Sheila have been interrogated, it's then Gerald's turn. Um, he earlier on tried to convince Sheila to, to hide information from the inspector. Um, he also then admits, when he's being interrogated by the inspector, he admits to keeping Eva Smith, who at this point is known as Daisy Renton, because she changed her name, as his mistress for six months. So that is somebody who he was sleeping with, even though he was in a relationship with Sheila. So it's like a, it's a horrible expression, but his woman on the side, if you like, the extra person in the, in the triangle, a love triangle. And this was for six months as well. And at that, during that six months, he had told Sheila that he was too busy because he was at the work. So he wasn't able to see her as much as she wanted to. He disappears then. There's a big chunk of Gerald disappearing after he's been interrogated. He goes off to recover himself and try and get over how upset he's feeling. And then he reappears after the inspector has left. He's the one who suggests that there was no Inspector Gould. He's been asking questions. He saw a police officer on the street, asked if he knew any Inspector Gould and there wasn't one. He then telephones up the infirmary to see if there's a dead girl been brought in with suicide. There isn't. So Gerald's a real key character in... Uh, in sort of moving the plot forward there, really, and discovering that this is a hoax. 
And the thing which sort of makes me staggered, really, about just how how much he hasn't learned his lessons is at the very end of the play, he asks Sheila whether that whether he says, what about this engagement ring to her, as implying that, as this is all over, maybe we should get married after all, ignoring the fact that he actually still did admit to having an affair with another woman. But that's all fine now, apparently. Anyway, that's my personal opinion leaking through. I'm not a big fan of Gerald, I'll be honest. Um, and here are some key quotes for him. He is a character who, unlike some of the other Burling family, doesn't have so many what I would call like really juicy good quotes. Yet, there are things which really reveal the sort of person he is. And you need to think of Gerald as this sort of younger version of capitalism. He's the one who sort of shows that capitalism is is sort of not changing, really. He, it's stuck in its way. So even though he's young, other characters who are young show hope for the future because they look like they're going to change. Gerald doesn't. So here are some of the key quotes which I'll run through then on this slide. And I told you I was awfully busy at the works at the time, so that's a good quote showing him lying to Sheila. Um, there's the next one is, I believe you're right, sir. It's one of many quotes early on in the play where he is agreeing with something that Mr. Burling says. If you look back over a version of the play, a copy of the text, you'll see that for yourself early on. He does a lot of agreeing with the Burlings, which again, you could use as evidence for him following in that capitalist, uh, capitalist train, train, or what I mean, trail is the word. He's sort of going down that route is what I'm trying to say. Uh, you couldn't have done anything else is what he says when Mr. Burling talks about firing the striking workers. Eric then goes on to immediately disagree with that but once again there's another quote sort of showing that capitalist belief um, and then this is when he's trying to hide things from the inspector so for god's sake don't say anything to the inspector um, he is described as the wonderful fairy prince by Sheila being sarcastic when he came to the rescue of Daisy Renton which isn't what he really did because she believes that he was doing it for his own well so he could sleep with her in simple terms so that's why she uses that sarcastic phrase which is quite a good one maybe to remember he says later on, I didn't install her there so I could make love to her. I made her go because I was sorry for her. Talking about looking after Daisy Renton and why he put her up in this uh, this apartment, his friend's apartment. Um, then the last two quotes are quotes from the end of the play, once the inspector is gone, revealing that Gerald is the one who moves that plot forward. There isn't any such inspector we've been had, as in we've been had, there's a joke made of us. And that's the quote I was referring to a minute ago when he says, everything's all right now, Sheila, what about this ring? Implying that we're ready to get engaged again because it wasn't real, except, of course, it was because he did still sleep with another girl. And Sheila sort of <laughs> implies that, says that to him directly. Um, key thing here then, what does Gerald represent? The photo there in the background is sort of what you might describe as a dandy. He's described as a dandy in his appearance early on. And a dandy is a sort of very flamboyant way of dressing, very over the top, uh, very confident, very smart as well. Sort of an old fashioned elegance. You could use the word debonair or suave maybe as well. But what does he represent? So I've put there upper class men. After all, he is to follow in his father's footsteps, taking over that business. His father's a knight and his lady, his mother is a lady. I'll put the keyword there. The aristocracy is like this highest level of upper class as well. And that's what Gerald seems to be representing in the play. Also, he's like fulfilling the patriarchy there. The patriarchy, I've said, like this idea of a male-led, male-dominated society. He's already moving into starts taking over his father's business when his father is too old to. And it just sort of is this cycle um, of money staying in the same hands and and old families looking after it. I did another video uh, on socialism and capitalism, which is very much worth checking out, which covers this in the class system. And you'll find that on my channel. And also just repeating the ideas and the mistakes of Mr. Burling and his generation, because he can, so keeps agreeing with Mr. Burling, particularly when Mr. Burling makes the wrong predictions at the start of the play. So Gerald is quite a key character in that sense, because he's the only one really from outside the family that we see making mistakes. So it's, it broadens this idea that it's not just one family making mistakes, but this whole this whole class system is represented by these characters and that's what Priestley is trying to convey to us. So which themes could you link Gerald with then? Well there's some key ones on the screen there. Power over over Eva Smith and the lives of others. Capitalism in the sense that he agrees uh, with Mr. Burling and what his beliefs about workers working and them making as much money as they can. I put there which generation because unlike others he doesn't clearly fit into any particular generation. However because he sides with Mr. Burling particularly I would therefore put him with that older generation or certainly repeated mistakes. I've put a couple bullet points down. He's about to repeat the mistakes of that older generation. He very much represents this class system certainly and also I put there at the bottom like keeping up appearances like this 
idea of keeping money in the same families and and being stuck basically is almost what he represents this stuck system which Priestley believes needs to change so possible exam questions then because sometimes you will get exam questions specifically asking about characters like the top one how does Priestley present Gerald's relationship with women in an inspector course the brackets there that sample assessment material so before the exam papers were first released, they gave us some examples, and that question came from an example. So it's been a long time since Gerald has come up in a question at the time of recording this video, which means he might come up again. And his relationship with women, well, you could certainly look at how he tries to be good, but in fact, all he's really doing seemingly is using her, um, and what that sort of shows about the lower class and the upper class relationships. You could actually link the relationship with women directly back to class, I would say, as well, how he uses her. Um, I also put the other question from May 2018 beneath it. How does Priestley present the importance of social class? Now, in some ways, what I just said about the first question could almost link directly to the next question. You could talk about social class, but then link it back to gender as well. Beneath that, under suggestions, um, there's another sample assessment material question there. The importance of the ending. I put that one there because Gerald is very much part of the ending and the one who moves that forwards and beneath that as well using I made that question up how does Priestley use Gerald to show the importance of responsibility the fact that Gerald doesn't really seem to take responsibility almost represents the class and how the upper class weren't taking enough responsibility for their actions and these actions have consequences anyway Moving on then, this is the final thing for me today. I would ask you now to stop and try and answer those questions. So pause the screen. You should find all the answers have been gone through in this video. Test yourself on him and see uh, see if you can answer those questions. And all it remains for me to say is thanks very much for watching this video. I didn't think I'd have that much to say about Gerald, but apparently I did. So uh, do check out my other videos on my channel as part of your revision as you're going through the other characters and key themes. Uh, thanks very much for watching and good luck for your exams. Bye-bye.